Great, do please take a seat. Uh, and it would be helpful, I think, if we took up our Bibles to turn to the reading that uh, Sarah read a moment ago, Genesis 2. Uh, and as we turn for it, um, why don't I pray? Uh, the psalmist said, Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray along with the psalmist that this morning you would open our eyes, that we might see the wonderful things in your word. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. I forgot to ask someone who's got the zapper. Thank you. What is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? Well, according to Douglas Adams, you know the answer is 42 in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, it took Monty Python a bit longer to give their answer to it. And that's probably the meaning of life, or Lif, one of their lesser-known films, I think. Uh, it took them one hour and 47 minutes of, uh, well, of Monty Python madness to address that question. But if you were to give your answer to that question, how long would it take you, and what would you say? Have you actually ever given it any serious thought? I mean, it's not a question that comes up often in normal conversation, is it? Uh, I don't know, life's too busy, perhaps, or, or sometimes just too hard, uh, to think long and hard about the significance of who we are. No time, no energy. Well, the Bible is a book given to us by God. Not literally, obviously. It's written by several dozens of human authors over hundreds of years, recording the events in human history in which and through which God gives his answer. The answer. And we've been looking at the last couple of weeks at the opening chapters of Genesis, uh, where he begins to give that answer. Answer to the question of who we are, what we're here for, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Questions of identity and significance and purpose. Which, of course, are not just academic questions. When they're put like that, they can sound a bit academic, can't they? But they're not. They're intensely practical because whether they're thought through or not, how you answer those questions, who you are, what you're here for, have has huge significance on how you live your life, how you regard yourself, how you regard and treat other people. How we spend our time and energy will, to a very large extent, be determined by the answer we give those questions. Now, last week, we began to see how, in the opening pages of the Bible, the record of the beginning of all things, of everything, begins to speak to those questions of meaning and purpose and significance. And we continue to do that this morning as we arrive in the second chapter, chapter 2. Now, it may well be that as you read that, as it was read to us uh, a moment ago, meanings of, of significance and purpose weren't at the top uh, of your questions, that you had a whole lot of other questions crowding in as it was read out. Valid questions, I'm sure. I mean, is there anything that isn't a valid question? All questions are valid. But sometimes the questions that we bring can be a bit of a distraction, and we can miss, as we concentrate on the questions we have, as to what the author is seeking to tell us. So I want to put any sort of questions that you may have about the chapter to the side for one moment, and ask the question of what the writer is saying here about what he's thinking is the meaning and the significance of the universe and of human life in particular. What I want to do this morning is just simply walk through the chapter uh, with you. Let us walk through it together. Asking the question, what do these verses reveal to us about the significance of the universe, of this world, of life and human life? In particular. Well, at the outset, chapter 2, verse 4, we get, uh, uh, it begins really this account, a second account of creation. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. 
when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, and the earth and the heavens. Now, so far in Genesis, we've seen one count already of the creation of all things, heaven and earth, all things, by God, by his powerful word. And chapter 2 gives us another account, a second account, that looks at things from a slightly different angle. Same event, but a complementary view that again is of the beginnings of all things. It's the beginning. Actually, it's really only the beginning of accounts because we'll need to get to the end, we'll need to read all the Bible actually and get to the very end before this story finishes. But in this uh, chapter, as God tells the story in chapter 2, this is how God tells us the significance of things, of life, the universe, and everything. Now, other people have attempted to do that. I don't know if a brief history of time rings any bells for you. Stephen Hawking, it's what made him famous, I think. A bit of a publishing, uh, uh, well, it's unusual. It's not usual for a, a, a book on physics to sell over 25 million copies, I understand. In it, he spoke of his attempt to explain in non-technical terms for non-physicists the origin, development, and eventual uh, fate of the universe. It only contained one equation, E equals mc squared, and I'm told it only uh, obtain, contained one equation because his publisher said, every equation you include will reduce your readership by half. So he only put one in, but there are lots of tables and charts and things, and I have to say, I found it, um, well, my physics A-level didn't really help me. I found it completely incomprehensible. I'm pleased to say that when God gives us his account of the significance and the purpose of everything, it is much more accessible. It begins, verse 5, Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. So we're directed back to the beginnings of all things, even before the beginning of life, actually. There's no vegetation, there's no shrub, there's no plant, not least because there's no water yet. Part of the picture that in some ways parallels chapter 1, verse 2, when we're told all is formless and empty. Now, whatever these verses mean exactly, how literal we're meant to take them, and to what, or to what extent they're a picture, one thing is undeniable, I think, that these verses describe a place, a world, that is very different from our own. Not the world as we know it. And if we go back to that time and want to understand the significance of what's going on, where would you look, do you think? It seems to me that we begin to see the significance of what's going on when we get to verse 7. This chapter consists really of three pictures, uh, three panes, if you like, three snapshots, uh, three shorts, verse 1 to, to 7, verse 8 to 18, and verse 19 to the end. And each one, each picture, each short, each little video clip, if you like, reads a climax, and the first climax here is in verse 7, with the formation of man, Adam, from the ground. Paralleling, in some ways, I think, day six of the earlier account. Verse seven, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So a picture, a description of humankind being created by God. And bringing with it some very significant implications, I think. And the first, uh, perhaps it's an obvious one, but obvious things sometimes need to be said, otherwise they can be overlooked. The fact that humankind is created by the Lord God means that it is impossible to understand who we are or the significance of who we are without reference to him. It just can't be done. Any understanding of humanity that ignores that will be necessarily inadequate. 
Secondly, do you know that God is described here as the Lord God? The Lord Yahweh, that personal rescuing God whose name was revealed to Moses sometime later. Which means that God here is not only the creator God, he is also the rescuing God, the God who saves. And that's going to be very significant in due course. The third point, I think, do you notice that man is made from dust? What does that mean? Well, if you're a Philip Pullman fan, can you just put to one side for the moment his understanding of dust? It's very complicated, and it's not what's being talked about here. It's not helpful. Being formed from dust simply means that there isn't anything unusual about the stuff that we're made of. Humankind's significance doesn't come from the stuff that we're made of. Look at the stuff, and you'll see very little difference between the stuff that we're made of and that everything else is made of. There are lots of other similar carbon-based life forms with very similar DNA. An analysis of that stuff won't tell you anything about the significance of that stuff. Because in verse 7, you notice that the stuff isn't everything. The formation of humankind doesn't stop there. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. There is a unique relationship here between God and man that he created a unique intimacy that is not shared with everything else. Paralleling, I think, the idea in chapter 1, verse 27, God creating mankind in his image. Now, I think some caution is needed here. We don't want to overread the text. Uh, there's, not, there's two distinct components to humankind, to humanity, the material and immaterial, the body and the soul. The perishable mortal bit, the physical, the imperishable spiritual bit, the eternal soul. That's not, I think, what's being said here. They're Greek, those ideas come from Greek thought and not from the Bible. The Bible's view of what it is to be human is to be a whole, a unit, a unity, if you like. And when the Bible speaks of immortality, it doesn't think of some, speak of some uh, bodiless spirit. It speaks in terms of bodily resurrection. To be human is to be a unity, a whole, uh, not a split personality, as it were. So scene one, verses five to seven, points to the significance of the universe and of humanity. Not something that could be known just by looking at humanity, but the stuff that we're made of. Our significance is determined by the fact that we have been made by God. He has given us life. And the next two scenes, verses 8 to 18 and 9 to 25, well, they tell us even more. So the second scene, verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man he'd formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So what do we learn from this second scene, as it were? Well, we learn, first of all, that God is a gardener. He's planted a garden in the east in Eden and placed man in it. And it seems that part of being human here is to be provided for by God. He cares for humanity. He provides for them. In fact, it's more than just provide, isn't it? He lavishly provides for them. All kinds of trees, lots of them, all good for food, all pleasing to the eye. So there's beauty here as well. Not just food, there's beauty. And of the multitude of those trees in the garden, our attention is drawn specifically to two of them. Verse 9, in the middle of the garden with the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Worth taking note of those two trees. They'll appear later on in the story. 
Uh, the tree of life, what does that mean? Well, we'll meet the tree of life again in the next chapter, in chapter 3, where we'll discover that eating the, from this tree of life, and you'll live forever. And in chapter 3, God refuses humankind access to this tree. There's no suggestion here, though, in the garden in Genesis 2, that its fruit was forbidden. The other tree, the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, well, what does that mean? More of that in a moment. But what else do we learn from this place of plentiful provision that God has given to those he's created? Well, it seems that the garden is in this world. It's recognizable in the sense it's a place of work, verse 15. A place of plentiful food, a place with resources, with gold and onyx. A place not for lotus-eating idleness, but for work. There's work to be done. And it seems that part of being human, what it means to be human, is the responsibility to work. That's part of what it means. Now, there's a workplace dignity survey in 2020. I don't know if anyone was asked to contribute to it. Okay, well, it existed, apparently. Amongst its conclusions was that employees found dignity in work and gained dignity from work. I'm not quite sure the difference between those two. But anyway, I don't think either should come as a surprise. I don't think it's done. I think we know that work is good for us. It may not be enjoyable, but we know that it's good. Every GP knows that work is good for people to have. Indeed, anyone able to, unable to work for, for whatever reason knows that too. Indeed, only having two contact hours a week and not doing any other work is not good for students either. Work is good. It's part of what it means to be human. And so we see that humankind in the garden, it's not just part of nature, not just passive consumers. There are dist we are distinct beings, different from the rest of creation, with responsibility is in God's world, to care for it, to work for it. And these are important parts of being human, but not the most important part here. Because having formed him, having provided for him, having given him responsibilities in the garden, verse 16, God speaks. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good or evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And so it seems that part of the extraordinary dignity of being human, of what it means to be human, is to be spoken to by God. Who in effect says, look, listen, listen, will you? And we saw the importance of listening in Mark 4 last week, didn't you? Listen, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. You're free. Eat, enjoy it. All the trees here, all the fruit, it's yours. Have it. Look what I provided. Enjoy it. But there is a limit to the freedom that he gives his creatures. It's not an absolute freedom. Only God has absolute freedom. So Adam is not allowed to eat from one tree, just one. There are plenty of others, more than enough. And it's not an arbitrary restriction, is it? There's good reason to avoid this tree. If you eat it, God warns, you will certainly die. Why can't I eat it? Because it will destroy you. So it's clear then, there is a limit on the freedom that God gives Adam. A limit that's not to be crossed. He's not free to know good and evil in the way that God does. But what does that mean? I want to realize that God's knowledge of good and evil is not a knowledge of something outside him, as though there's something outside, an external reference point, an external standard. No, God determines the standard. What he loves is good, what he hates is evil, by definition. 
he defines it. And in contrast here, humankind is not free to make those decisions. Not free to make that judgment. It's not humankind's place to decide what is good and what is evil. Because being human does not mean being God. Humans are not God. God is God. We have enormous privileges and are enormously blessed, but it is clear, isn't it here? If human beings who are not God insist on being God, it will be their destruction. Could it have been made any clearer? Well, so ends scene two and into scene three, the final scene, perhaps of a three-act play. And it's something of a surprise, I think, and I wonder if you're surprised by it, that for everything we've seen so far, all that has been said, for all we see about humankind's significance and God's provision, verse 18, there is something that is not good. The Lord God said, it is not good. It is not good, not yet complete. There is an incompleteness to it. Well, why? How so? Well, we're told it is not good for man to be alone. Adam is alone. And aloneness, loneliness, is not good. He has not made man to be alone. And so God determines to change that. He will fix it. And he says, I will make a helper suitable for him. A helper, that's an interesting word, isn't it? Uh, interesting and potentially explosive. Because we've read ahead, haven't we? And we know that that helper is woman. Man, a uh, woman made as man's helper. What does that mean? Does it mean that she's there to do his bidding? No. Does it mean that woman's job is to be confined to the domestic sphere? No. Does it mean that woman's job is to just enable him to do his job of fulfilling the earth, you know, sort of a baby machine? No. Does it mean that it's woman's job to be at man's beck and call? No. The word for helper here is Isa, a Hebrew word, and it's a word that God himself uses elsewhere in the Bible to describe his relationship to Israel. God is Israel's helper. So just one example, if you're taking notes, Deuteronomy 33, 29. Uh, Moses says, Blessed are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord." He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. God is helper, saviour, warrior, protector. And he's at no man's beck and call. But does the use of the term necessarily imply that man is incompetent then and needs a good woman to sort him out? No. No. The problem here is not with incompetence, it is with aloneness. And the solution which is to be found is a suitable helper. And so, verse 19, the search is on. All the wild animals and birds and livestock were brought to Adam, but in all creation no such helper was found. And so, verse 21, the Lord caused man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man and brought her to the man. Nothing in the whole world can meet the need of man's aloneness. So God provides a helper, a suitable one, a corresponding one. Nothing here said about roles. Nothing said here about how men and women is a function. Nothing said here about the work, how the work in the garden is to be divvied up. Nothing is said here about intellectual capacity, any di or any difference indeed, other than the physical, which is uh, 
intimated in verse 24. Because it's not really difference that is being talked about, you see. The focus here is rather on sameness. And we get that, don't we? As woman is introduced to man, we get the first song, the first rejoicing, if you like, the first song in history, an exclamation of joy. And he sings, he sings, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, similarity. At last, a suitable helper, no longer alone. Which is why, verse 24, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Talking there about marriage, and however others may define it, this is how God defines marriage. This is his definition, the physical union in marriage of one man and one woman. And it's a kind of reuniting. It's a uniting, a reunion, a reuniting, because the two have become one. The most intimate of all relationships, and it is good. Provided for by God, it is a good thing. And something that is very important in human life. We'll get a glimpse of just how important in a moment. But before we go there, let's just see where we got to, really. If you want to understand the significance of life, the universe, and everything, if you want to begin to understand what it is to be human, what it means to be men and women, and that being men and women is a good thing, then this is where the story starts. Although verse 25 ends on a bit of a strange note. I don't know if if you thought that as it was being read out. It's a bit puzzling at first, I think. But it is a reminder, perhaps, that uh, the key, to and a key, perhaps, to understanding life, the universe, and everything, is that what we've been looking at this morning, life in the garden, is not like life as we know it now. Because you see, in verse 25, there's no sense of shame, there's no sense of vulnerability, there's no sense of threat in the garden at this point. Very different from the world that we live in, isn't it? We know shame, we know the sense of shame, we know the sense of being vulnerable, we know the sense of threat. We experience all those things. Why? 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 Do we experience that? What's happened? Well, to discover that, you need to read on, and we'll do that next week. But for now, Genesis three, uh, Genesis 2, I, I wonder if we can see just how important this start of the story is, this beginning of it. Actually, it's even more important than we begin to see, because do you know what? It contains a secret. A secret that actually isn't disclosed for many, many years and much nearer the end of the story. You have to read on to the arrival of Jesus to understand the secret. Paul talks about it in one of his letters, most clearly, Ephesians 5. He looks at this chapter, he quotes verse 24 and says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And then he says... This is a profound mystery, a profound secret. But, he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. What's he talking about? What does he mean? Why is Genesis 2, this profound mystery, a deep secret? Well, as we read on, we'll begin to see that the disconnects between what we've been reading about in Genesis 2, and our own experience. That in being in what human means, being created by God, being provided by God, being responsible to God, well, we, reality is that's not what we think about life often, isn't it? It's not the ascent of our consciousness that we're created by God and that we're responsible to him. Our first thought is that, well, This is my life, and I'm going to live it my way and not pay much reference to him. And do we really think that God provides for us, or do we think that it's by our own hard work and graft that we 
put a roof over our heads and food on the table? And do we really think that our first and most respon- that first and foremost we are responsible to God before anyone? Genesis 2 is a land of mystery, a profound mystery, a deep secret. And to answer that, to, to make that more our experience, Jesus Christ came, he died, and he rose again. Why? Well, to return us to the garden, to make us fully human again, to restore our true humanity And if you really want to know what life, the universe, and everything is about, don't don't read Douglas Adams, don't read Stephen Hawking, don't read Philip, we'll read them, but don't look for answers there. Look at Jesus Christ and those whom he's restoring to full humanity. Because Jesus Christ came to restore to full humanity those who trust in him. Come to him. Trust in him. Do that and you're beginning to be restored. And you can look forward to the day when you will be fully human again. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that this world is not meaningless. And thank you that you give us a significance and purpose And thank you, Heavenly Father, that that significance and purpose is not hidden from us, that you have told us about it and revealed it ultimately in your Son. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would all come to him, trust in him, and be fully restored. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen.